Ring around the rosy, a pocket full of posies. Ashes, ashes, we all fall down. <laughs> Welcome to the Parasite Podcast. I'm Sherry. And I'm Marie. This week we're following up with Herman and Drewy Dutton, brothers who killed their highly abusive father. This is part two, so if you have not yet listened to part one, stop right now and go listen to it first. We'll wait right here for you. For the rest of you, as you may recall, Herman and Drewy shot their father because after telling them for their entire lives to kill anyone who messed with Sissy, he messed with Sissy. This episode contains references to sexual abuse, familial abuse, and murder. Listener discretion is advised. While the neglect and abuse in the Dutton household had not gone unnoticed, nobody in the small town of Rush Springs had rescued the children from Lonnie Dutton. After the murder, the whole town rallied around Herman and Drewy, working hard to advocate for lenient punishment and a brighter future for the boys. I am so glad that the town rallied around them and supported them now, but this was not even their hour of greatest need. They couldn't get support until after they handled their problem on their own, in a way that no 15-year-old should have to handle anything. Oh, I completely agree, but we weren't there. If you listen to the stories and look at this, these people were terrified for their own families. Mm -hmm. Lonnie would come after them, not just them personally, but their families, their farms. Mm -hmm. He would pull out all the stops. And I think it would be really scary to try to stand up for someone knowing that this man might destroy your entire livelihood or your entire family just to get even. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like the police hadn't supported them before trying to deal with much smaller problems than child abuse. No, I think this probably went down a slippery slope, but Lonnie definitely was doing what he wanted in that town. Mm -hmm. Despite the fact that Herman was only 15, Herman could have been tried as an adult. Because it's a capital offense, you can be pretty young and still be tried as an adult. Mm. And it varies state to state. But I think in light of how clear the case was and how clear the history of abuse was, they were both tried as juveniles. Good. And that's really important because that means that their hearings were closed and that they would not end up going to an adult prison. They would end up in a group home or juvenile detention as the worst case scenario. The district attorney seems to have really struggled with this case and how to mete out justice because this is a very serious crime. Murder is always serious and he needed to follow the law and the meaning of the law but also take into account what these boys had been through. That makes sense. Mm Mm-hmm. So a plea deal was offered to the boys and this was a really unusual deal. This is not the kind of deal that most murderers of any age are going to get. Okay. Under this plea deal, the boys would both plead no contest to first-degree manslaughter, and the plea would be held without action until Herman, the older brother's 18th birthday. And if the boys participated in their treatment and stayed out of trouble, meaning didn't commit any other crimes, Mm -hmm. then it would all go away. I think I've heard about something like this before. Do they call it like a plea in advance? I don't know. What does that mean? A plea in advance is when they plea no contest to whatever they've been charged with, and the judge kind of holds that in his pocket as the person tries to get treatment. Oh. If the person successfully finishes treatment, everything goes away. But if they don't, then the judge already has that no contest plea, which is treated as a guilty plea, where he can just meet out punishment oh okay. make a sentence sentence them yeah at some point in the future mm-hmm. that's a cool little system i wasn't sure exactly how this happened so the family hated the plea deal they thought that the boys could get a better deal taking their chances going to trial and trying to get the case dismissed as justifiable homicide isn't that a little bit crazy no i mean i don't think any jury would have convicted these boys unfortunately a trial would have been grueling and probably deeply traumatizing for them and for Sissy because they would all have had to testify. They would have been on trial. Everyone would have known all the details of their abuse. It would have taken, I don't know, maybe a week. It would have been an extremely horrible process for them and then the sentencing hearings would have been horrible for them. And while they probably would not have been convicted of murder, 
who knows what they would have been convicted of, and they probably would have spent some time in some sort of detention center or juvenile treatment center. The other consideration that would make it hard to say justifiable homicide, though not impossible, is that Lonnie was asleep. So in traditional self-defense defenses, Mm -hmm. the person needs to be currently attacking you. Now, more modern case law has the battered spouse or even more recently the battered child syndrome where if it's this constant violence in the family killing them when you have the opportunity might still be seen as justified but it's a lot riskier than if you had shot them while they were attacking you yeah that battered child syndrome was actually discussed in this case and they said that this would be the first one tried under the battered child syndrome theory Mm -hmm. in oklahoma which was kind of a risk if they had Mm -hmm. done that these boys may have been convicted because the battered child syndrome is often rejected by the judge or by the jury and i think that the plea deal they gave them was really good in part because it didn't immediately put them back with the family that Lonnie had come from because remember their mother's side of the family was not an option they couldn't just take them and move them to Texas they had to have a place for these children to grow up and putting them just with grandma and grandpa or with aunts and uncles without further support may not have been the best situation for them to heal and they had a lot to heal from Yeah, and a lot of people wanted these kids after this was over. So was the plea offer accepted? Yes, it was. So they both pled no contest under a deferred juvenile adjudication, which I think is the child's version of that plea in abeyance that you were talking about. Oh, okay. That allowed the judge to keep an eye on them, and if it turned out that these boys really were violent or anything other than the upstanding but abused children they appeared to be, he could sentence them for manslaughter. Which is great, and I'm glad that they were able to get such a good deal that actually gave them what they needed while keeping them away from society. But don't they still need guardians? They did still need guardians, which is where it got really complicated. Well, I know based on my research, not a lot of these kids, but some of these kids actually get the case dismissed as justifiable homicide. Mm -hmm. And in those cases, the kid shakes hands with their attorney and goes home. In this case, the plea deal that they have offered actually keeps the kids in a system where they're going to get treatment, where it's going to be modeled for them how to be in a loving home because they'll be in a therapeutic group home or in a foster care home. It seems like a better deal. I'm surprised that the family didn't like this. Part of it may have been that in families systems that are clannish. Mm -hmm. They don't want outsiders interfering with their business, and this meant that until Herman was 18, there would be people, therapists, possibly foster care, all sorts of people in their family business, which feels very threatening if you're in this kind of family. Well, I think that's invasive in any family, and Mm -hmm. I agree. I think in a clan, that probably would kill them. Plus, They know that if the boys are in a therapeutic home, Sissy and Jake are not going to be with them. Mm. And I think the family voiced several times that it was going to kill these children not to be with each other physically. Mm -hmm. They didn't understand what they were doing, but they were working to support that enmeshing. Mm -hmm. That's really not healthy for the kids. Yeah, having Herman and Drewy be the parents for the younger children was not healthy even though it was probably extremely stressful for the children to be separated, they probably needed that to grow together as siblings instead of parents and children. I think so. I think they needed to disturb what was going on Mm -hmm. in that family. Even though that closeness, like we said when we talked about clanism, helped the children to survive what they were going through, it was going to destroy their family eventually if it continued. Mm Mm-hmm. Because you can't have a healthy relationship where you're the parent of your sibling. Exactly. Some of the bad things about clans are also the good things about clans. They really want all of their family members. Mm That can be bad when it tips over into the controlling side, but there were a lot of people who wanted these kids, and a lot of family members felt like they had let all of these children down in the past. They wanted to be there for them now. So they didn't want the kids to be in foster care or in group homes or any of that. They wanted them to be in their family's care. Drewy's attorney claimed the entire family was dysfunctional from top to bottom, which I can see sounds like they had problems, intergenerational problems. A lot of problems. But attorney parents said that there literally isn't anyone in this family who doesn't have a skeleton in the closet. Oh my. 
Yeah, so a few of these people, some of the players, so Luther Denton, which would be their grandfather, Mm -hmm. wanted custody of Herman and Drewy, the boys who committed the murder and had been parenting other children. And his reasoning was a little bit strange, but he was confident he could whip them into shape, Mm -hmm. which I don't think is what they needed. They didn't Um, need any more whippings. No, they didn't, and they were really in shape in a lot of ways. What they needed was some nurturing. Well, didn't he have a history of abusing his family? Yes, he did, and probably Lonnie learned some of his parenting skills from his parents, which were not good. I bet so. Luther countered these complaints by saying he'd only slapped his wife around for like five years, and that ended 35 years ago when he learned his lesson. Okay. That doesn't sound like someone who really understands how bad that is. Um... But he he also said he was heavy-handed as a parent, but he had never physically abused his grandchildren. He resented being placed under the microscope as a prospective garden, which, by the way, everyone trying to foster a child or adopt a child or become a legal guardian for a child is carefully examined. Well, I think that you see that entitlement coming out in this grandfather. Mm -hmm. And I think when you said that he said that he, like, had never abused his grandchildren, they'd never been in his home as his children. Was that going to hold up when they were living in his home as his children? Well, especially if his idea of discipline is pretty harsh. So I think his heart was in the right place. I just think that he might not have been the best place right then for those kids. I can see and give credit to the grandfather for wanting to be there for his grandchildren, even though that may not have been... I agree with the courts that this was not perhaps the ideal placement. Not for right then. Mm Mm-hmm. So then there was also their mother, Rosemary Dutton. She'd been living in Texas, and she was working as a casino security guard. And she reappeared on the scene, and she wanted custody of her boys. According to the Daily Oklahoman, Herman's attorney quickly filed a motion to terminate parental rights against Rosemary, stating... Neither of the boys wants to go back to their mother. Right now, they're in counseling and school. It's the best environment they've been in in their lives, which was probably 100% true. I think so. And he didn't believe that moving to Texas or living with their mother would be in their best interests, and her rights were terminated after she failed to meet court-ordered requirements regarding what she needed to do to get her life in order so that she could care for the boys, and she failed to appear in court when ordered. So, Rosemary pretty much disappeared again after that. Okay, so that kind of makes sense. You see that a lot. The parents love their kids, but their lives really aren't quite stable enough that they can actually take care of their kids. And it sounds like Marie spent most of her life in that situation. Yeah, it does. Was there anyone else? Lonnie's sister, Linda Munn, so their aunt, she had mostly been estranged from her family since 1984. Which was probably healthy. She probably was smart to be a little bit more distant from this Mm -hmm. family. But after Lonnie's death, she moved her own family into the trailer that they had shot their father in Mm -hmm. and asked for custody. She believed it would be best to keep the kids in the same school and in the same community but with their foster parent. Oh, I don't I don't like that one. I think that that is a really weird way to try to find stability for them. But it makes sense if you use that clanism theory. Yeah, because it emphasizes being with your family and... And letting the family work through it with the kid. That makes sense. Yeah, then there was also the concern that they would still be living on the family farm and Grandpa Luther had been abusive to his wife and his own children, allegedly. Is that really the best place to be raising children who have already been abused? And then also, Linda had her own children. Courts determined that living in the same home, going to the school where they were already really bullied pretty badly, would not be in their best interest at that time. And Linda's husband was also in the military, so they moved every few years, which would interrupt the counseling that they desperately needed. Uh. So there were a lot of reasons why Linda wasn't the right choice. Then Lonnie's other sister, their Aunt Dinah, who was the mother of the cousin that they loved, Mm -hmm. yeah, Wayne, Mm -hmm. she also wanted to be a guardian. So she felt like she was the best potential guardian because she had custody of Sissy and Jake, which makes sense. I don't think it makes sense. She did have Sissy and Jake, but I think she would have had a lot of competition from Herman trying to parent them. He was used to being the parent, and I think that the family dynamics would have been such that he would have been butting heads with her all the time because he needed some space and he needed to learn how to understand how to be a kid. Yeah, he did need some space to experience some degree of childhood. Because you're right, he did spend his childhood being a parent. All the decision makers, meaning the courts and attorneys and all of those people, Mm -hmm. agreed that anyone from this family would have to receive mandatory counseling before the boys could be placed with any of them. The custody battle ended up with the courts appointing a guardian 
Darla Lawrence for the boys. She wasn't a relative at all. That makes sense. I think that was the best, at least temporarily, and it seems to have worked out. Mm -hmm. But Herman and Drewy spent the remainder of their childhoods receiving therapy, education, and care under the auspices of DHS, provided that they stay out of trouble until Herman's 18th birthday. Now, this is also really important because it doesn't look like the family had the resources to provide the kind of therapy that exactly. these boys would need. Yeah. So the kind of therapy that these boys would need would be expensive, and with DHS providing it, they could get more and maybe some access to experts they wouldn't have been able to see otherwise. Right. At this point, they're in Tulsa. They were placed in separate therapeutic settings that were in close proximity to each other so that they could attend school together every day and maintain a close relationship but have a little space to kind of grow individually. I think that someone put a lot of thought into the placement of all of these children. They sound, it sounds like someone was very wise in their decision making. Yeah, and honestly, they're very lucky in one way only, really, and that was, this was 1993. A lot of the trauma research had been done, and the general public wasn't trauma-informed at all, but experts knew enough about really horrific child abuse that they made some really good choices. They did. Even if they were probably uncomfortable choices, they probably were some smart choices. Right. After they finished with court, the boys left the courthouse and went to the Southwest Youth and Family Services Center. Their aunt, Linda Munn, reported that these kids had an unusually close connection and they needed to see each other and know that everything was going to be okay. I like that. Yeah, I think that was really considerate. Their Aunt Linda did a lot for them. She did. It, it's hard because their family structure was not very healthy, but it was very warm and close, and a lot of people cared about them. Right. Maternal family members were also present in court and knew about the party, but they were also clear on the fact that they were not welcome. Oh, dear. So there was a split there, too. But... They reconnected, they gave Herman a poster of his hero, Michael Jordan, and they went back to the trailer to collect the baseball card collection that Drewy had been missing and gave it to him at the party. That's nice. Yeah, and they had a cake that said, to a fresh start. They didn't really have a way to explain why they did this, but they bought the boys teddy bears. And Aunt Linda said, I know they might be too old for that, but we thought they needed something soft and cuddly. Which makes sense. If we know anything about trauma, we know about the idea of reparenting. Mm -hmm. And comfort objects can be really helpful in that. In fact, even adults who are trying to heal from trauma might find themselves really attached to stuffed animals or a special blanket. Because you need a lot of the things that we instinctively give children that abuse children don't get. Right. It seems like we have to cross those regardless of what age we do it or we get stuck in a bad place. Yeah, there's the, just certain milestones that you have to cross at some point. Fast forward to December of the same year, the boys were allowed to visit the Dutton family for a little Christmas celebration. Oh, so Grandma and Grandpa? Yeah, Luther and Nancy. Okay. And, of course, Aunt Linda and Aunt Dinah. Aunt Linda said the boys were gaining weight and they looked really healthy, which is so encouraging because it sounds like they were malnourished for years. Mm -hmm. Herman was living in a group home and Drewy was in a foster home a couple of blocks away. They spent a few nights a week with each other and they got to go to school together. They really wanted to live in the same home again with their two younger siblings. But Herman was learning how to be a child, no longer being forced into the role of a mother for his younger siblings. Drewy was also learning to let the adults handle adult matters, which I think was really healthy for both boys. I think it was too. And these boys were pretty bright too. They were working on getting caught up to grade level. They hadn't had a lot of time to study or focus on school. Right. Well, they um, missed a lot of school, too, because they were busy doing the chores and mm -hmm. taking care of all of the fires at home. And taking care of their father. Yes. They also received allowances for doing their chores in the foster home. Instead of using the money to buy toys or ice cream, these two boys decided to save their money to buy Jake and Sissy little crucifixes. So they still kind of had parenting instincts, Aww. and they were deeply religious. Oh, that makes me kind of cry. Yeah, they were very, very sweet brothers. They were... So approximately two years after their final court date, the day they had that party oh, uh -huh. and entered their plea, Herman and Drewy went to live with their grandparents, Luther and Nancy Dutton. They really did get together with their family pretty quickly. I think that shows the determination and love that Luther and Nancy both held for those boys and how they wanted them both back in their family. And imagine how difficult it would be to subject yourself to the scrutiny of the state. 
mm-hmm. when you're a very closed family. When you're a, a clan, yeah. Mm-hmm. I give them a lot of credit for that. I am really kind of proud of them. I am too. Just for doing so much and dealing with the discomfort, probably the most uncomfortable thing they'd ever done to take care of their grandson. Well, and to be honest, if you look at all of this, I'm sure that Luther was raised by someone who was the very same way. Mm -hmm. It's not that anyone was doing something bad and thinking they were being bad. No. You can tell that Luther had his heart in the right place. And that's the hard thing. People talk about generational trauma, and it's you're traumatized in a specific way, and you learn that's normal, and then you do the same thing to your children not knowing anything else and it just kind of goes through the generations and gets worse and worse or you notice that it's something that's bad and you try something different and it's just as bad because you really don't understand normal Mm -hmm. but eventually if they get enough help you can break that generational trauma and i think this family really did i do too Grandpa Luther was incensed that people believed he knew or should have known what was going on there right next door, about 300 feet away from his own home. But when pressed, he simply said that folks did not realize how intimidating Lonnie was. Later, he confessed that he did try to stand up for the kids. He said that two years before the kids shot Lonnie, he would confronted him about the hell he was creating next door. Later that night, Lonnie slipped through the woods back to his parents' home and shot his dad in the side with a shotgun. Oh my gosh. Yeah, uh, the violence did not stop with his own parents. Well, I hear that when his father would go over to visit the house, he would walk on the little trail between the two homes with his hands in the air saying, Papa's coming, Papa's coming, but still be ready for a bullet. Yeah, it sounds like Lonnie was really unpredictable and just scary. Completely erratic. There are rumors that Lonnie stabbed Luther once too, and he had some marks on his arm that he showed reporters after the murders. The knife fight was because he was telling him to be nicer to the kids. Wow. But Luther said he never brought charges or called the police because he said Lonnie would have killed me and my wife. His wife being Nancy, Lonnie's Mm -hmm. own mother. And he said that he was a monster. He said that Lonnie had held a gun to his own mother's head at least three times, warning her that he would kill her if she interfered with him and his kids. Luther also said that DHS requiring him and his wife Nancy to get counseling and go through the steps of reunification with their grandchildren was insulting and degrading. That's silly. Everyone has to do that. That's true. I don't think he probably had any experience with that, and I think that most people seeing it for the first time, it does feel degrading. You're being judged by total strangers. It's a really uncomfortable process but he swallowed his anger in order to get his grandkids back at the time of that report the daily oklahoman reported that herman was a senior in high school and a football player and he had a girlfriend drewy was in the ninth grade and he had just delivered a 30-minute sermon in front of their whole church on the topic of the importance of love. This part's a little strange, but Luther said that he never talked to the boys about what happened in the trailer, saying that what's done is done and there's no use dragging things out. He also says that he's told the boys that they can confide in him if they want to. Even stranger, he chose to leave this shot up trailer on the property right there in their backyard. He said that it doesn't bother the boys and maybe they can use it for a clubhouse. Oh, can you imagine that? Here, let's go play in the trailer that we can killed our dad in. That was the site of some horrific abuse, the sexual assault of their sister. I don't think they're going to want to play there. Well, and they're a senior and probably a sophomore. How many children of that age have a clubhouse? That's a little odd. I don't know that grandpa's thought that one through, but he does seem to care about these boys. They seem to be doing well under his care. He does. What happened to the two younger kids? Sissy and Jake, they were on track to be adopted by Lonnie's sister, Dinah, Wayne's mom. Right. Luther Dutton and his two daughters, Dinah and Linda, still had some hard feelings between them after the case had been settled. Yeah, from what I could see, it looks like the daughters are both pretty angry about their own childhoods, Mm -hmm. and this shooting brought up a lot of baggage and kind of unsettled some things that had been settled. I think it's hard. It sounds like Luther was less abusive than Lonnie was, but a very strong believer in physical punishment. I think he was very authoritarian. Mm -hmm. And I think that he also was participating in clanism when he raised his kids, which Mm -hmm. probably goes back quite a few generations in this family. (laughs) 
after the murder, these boys never had any trouble. They did great in foster care, they did great with their grandparents, and when Herman turned 18, the judge dismissed the charges, and they were free to move their lives forward. Yay, which is better than actually having it acquitted and going home and not getting any help, I think. I think that what happened after the murder really shows that these really were just really good kids. So. Back to the consequences for the kids. One of the really hard things about killing your father, regardless of the circumstances, is that people start really examining you and your family. Mm -hmm. And it's not really just people being lucky lose or I think you really do find people who are sincerely trying to find out new information and figure out how this happened. We really thought about should we use the real names of the people from this real story. We ended up using them because everyone received a ton of media attention. Their names are already out there. But another reason is because they show up on social media and it's interesting because families like this, they tend to turn out well. And that's not always the case for kids who are abused or for more broadly for kids who kill their parents. Here's a quick little review of how their lives are turning out so far as far as we can tell. Herman grew up to be a man of God. He's a very gentle, religious man. He's an associate minister at his local evangelical church, and he has a few children, and those kids appear to be very well loved and well cared for. He and his wife appear to be active in their community and loving parents. And other than a couple of speeding tickets, he's had no trouble with the law. From all appearances, he is still that good boy who grew up to be a good man, and he still grows a garden. Nice. I'm really happy for him that he gets to have a loving family. Me too. Drewy was a little bit harder to find information about. Obviously, we haven't met the Duttons, but Drewy seems to be a standout when it comes to making people smile. His love of life and sense of humor shows through. He's also married, and he had children, and appears to be a fabulous and very engaged father with well cared for and thoroughly loved children. He also, by all appearances, is a good boy who grew up to be a good man. And again, other than some traffic tickets and a couple of burning violations, like, you know, yard waste. On, on no burn days. Mm-hmm not arson, just yard waste. <laughs> he has not had any trouble with the law either. So both of these boys have grown up to be upstanding members of society. Their little sister, Sissy, she appears to have been better protected after the death of her father. After a brief visit to foster care, she briefly lived with her Aunt Linda and Uncle Gary. She later went to live with her Aunt Dinah and Uncle Joe, whose family ended up adopting her. It looks like she received a handful of traffic tickets and maybe one minor nonviolent charge over the past few decades. But again, a good kid who grown up to be a good person. She and her husband, with their two children, live about an hour away from her childhood home. Like his sister, Jake spent a few weeks in foster care after his dad was killed and then moved in with Aunt Linda and Uncle Gary, and then he too was living with and adopted by Aunt Dinah and Uncle Joe. He doesn't even have a reported traffic ticket. Again, a good boy who grew up into a good person. He and his wife live out of state, but seem to keep in touch with the family. And now that they're grown, it looks like many of the kids have reunited with their mother, Rosemary, who is currently living in Oklahoma. So the Dutton's neighbor, Karen Cavaney, the one that dodged all of those ricocheting bullets and tried to get the authorities to help the kids, mm -hmm. she once said, Lonnie will not be missed. Lonnie was cruel, neglectful, abusive, and their father. Sometimes those men are missed despite who they are. Oof. We personally spend about two decades collecting data and conducting research on kids who kill their parents. When looking at youthful offenders, those under the age of 25 years old, our research confirmed what other researchers, people like Hilbrand, Wiseman, Marlowe, Cipriano, and others were starting to realize. While abuse is part of the parasite equation, it is not a primary factor. In fact, in a study of 754 parasite offenders aged 25 and younger, and yes, Herman Dutton is included in the study group, approximately 15% of offenders had been abused and another 66% of offenders had never even alleged abuse. You can't say most youthful offenders were abused by any stretch. 
and that surprises a lot of people. Utilizing a statistical analysis technique called cluster analysis, we have identified five different cluster groupings that aid in classifying the types of kids who kill their parents. This is a typology, and we are currently using it to develop nascent theory regarding youthful parasite offenders, meaning if anyone was 25 years or older when they offended, they were not included or even looked at in this manner, yet. We will get there in the future. What are the five different types of youthful offenders? Here is a brief and preliminary look at them. We presented them in a peer-reviewed journal article and are still doing research on it. But here goes. First, there are erratics. These angry, violent children are often referred to as ticking time bombs by friends and relatives. They are often involved in drug use and are seldom abused by a parent. However, they are more likely to engage in parental abuse. The murders are often spontaneous. Next, we have alpha brats. These attention-hogging children are often charming con artists and very much in charge at home. If an accomplice is involved, that person was carefully groomed for the job of hitman. Alpha brats are seldom abused and often indulged. However, they do allege abuse more than would be expected. The murders are usually planned and very well planned. Third, we have anarchists. These broody kids appear to be convinced they are of a superior race to all of those around them. They deem themselves more clever than anyone, however, they most certainly are not. This category of killer is most likely to try to kill others, like mass murderer aspirations, but they are not very successful. They are strategic and often view their parent or parents as an obstacle in need of removal. They are often involved in drug use. Approximately one-third of them will allege abuse that will never be substantiated, yet more of them engage in parental abuse than are abused. The murders are equally planned or spontaneous. Fourth, we have mission-oriented. These are the children most likely to allege abuse that will never be substantiated. The murders are seldom spontaneous. They are more likely to attempt and be successful in killing other people. And last but not least, we have the tightly wound. These are kids who have learned to tightly control themselves. They follow community mores. They are very good at secret keeping, often in effort to keep themselves safe. This does not imply they are all abused children. Sometimes one stays safe by concealing dark secrets. These children are much more likely to experience abuse and are significantly less likely to allege abuse that will remain unsubstantiated. Not one of the children from this cluster was known to have menaced a parent prior to the murder. We'd like to thank Jade Brown for our theme music and the Oklahoman, the Democrat and Chronicle, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Sacramento Bee, and the Californian for a variety of information and the photos we used for this show. You can see the photos at Parasite.org. Just click on the Parasite podcast once you get to the website. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this episode. If you know of a parasite that you would like to see covered here, Please send us the name of the parasite offender and we'll add it to our list. And if you have any questions about parasites, let us know and we'll answer that question. Goodbye for now. See you in two weeks. Ashes, ashes, we all fall down. <laughs>